Hey, hello and how are you? Hey friends, welcome to the Shen Show. I am your host, Shenandoah Briscoe, coming to you from right here in St. Charles, Missouri. Hey, you know what? Today's Saturday, May 23rd, 2020. Got some happy birthday shout-outs. One going out to Connie Newman Gallion. And one going out to my godson, Patrick Allen Rosales. Or Rosales, Rosales, y'all. Mmm, Patrick Allen Rosales. Uh, he's the uh, honey, honeybee capital man of the world. Honeybee man. That's the honeybee man. Mm, Patrick Allen Rosales. So without further ado, here's birthday song for the two of you. I said, hey, y'all, it's birthday today. So happy birthday, I'm going to say. Uh, so, uh, Connie and Patrick, you all have started a brand new year today, so happy birthday to you, I say. I said, hey, I heard it's birthday today, so happy birthday, I'm going to say. You know you've started a brand new year today, so happy birthday to you, I say. And many more. You cha 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 wa 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 And a Facebook poke. Uh, Facebook poke going out to Amanda mm, Sue Little. Amanda Sue Little, uh, Brian Little's little sister. Uh, yeah, I'd have to say little sister on account. Ooh, I graduated in, I think Brian and me graduated in the same year in 84, and she graduated in 85 or 86, I think. I'm not sure. Anyway, St. Charles West High School, Amanda Sue. Uh, thank you for poking me, and uh, now I am poking you. All right, all right, all right. Um, that being said, how about some weather brought to you by Family First Home Health Care? That's right, Family First Home Health Care, LLC. They are in dire need of help. Uh, yep. He, he, homemakers, um, us, uh, CNAs. Nurses, you name it, you, they got in, uh, room for it. You give them a call. Um, oh, I guess I was gonna give you. I guess I can give you their number. Wake up. Wake up. Start Notepad. Family first home. Scratch that. Family first. Go to sleep. All right, their phone number is 636-757-3811. That's right, 636-757-3811. And you can call right now and talk to Tracy Berry. I'm sure she won't be real happy to be hearing from you right now, but hey, what the heck. Anyway, uh, that and um, they're always looking for people working in the St. Charles area. Hey, positions are available. Alrighty, alrighty, and okie dokie, um, they're located over at Westport Plaza, um, so you can go and apply over there too also, or you can apply online at family, that's uh, F-A-M-I-L-Y, or I guess that's family, first, and one, S-T, H-H-C for home health care, dot com. So go ahead and give it a try. All right. All right. So here's the weather forecast for the remainder of the day. Partly cloudy. Lows around 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Winds south at 5 to 10 miles per hour. And that was for tonight. Um, or it's, six, it's 86 degrees out there right now. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. Anyway, um, sun uh, for tomorrow, Sunday, May the 24th. Partly cloudy early, scattered thunderstorms developing in the afternoon. Highs around 87 degrees Fahrenheit and winds south at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Chances of rain 50%. And then scattered thunderstorms during the evening, then partly cloudy overnight. Lows around 68 degrees Fahrenheit and winds are going to be south to southeast at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Chances of rain 40%. Alrighty then, Monday, May 25th, scattered thunderstorms, highs around 88 degrees Fahrenheit, winds south at 5 to 10 miles per hour, chances of rain 50%, then a few clouds low overnight, lows near 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and winds south to southeast at 10 to 15 miles per hour. 
Uh, Tuesday, May the 26th, scattered thunderstorms throughout the day, highs around 81 degrees Fahrenheit, winds south to southeast at 5 to 10 miles per hour, chances of rain 50%. Then, uh, chances of isolated thunderstorms in the evening, then variable clouds overnight with more showers at times, lows around 68 degrees Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit. And winds southeast at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Chances of rain 40%. And then how's about a Wednesday, May the 27th. Scattered thunderstorms in the morning becoming more widespread in the afternoon. Highs around 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Winds southeast at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Chances of rain 80%. And then scattered thunderstorms overnight, lows around 68 degrees Fahrenheit, winds uh, light and variable, less than 5 miles per hour, chances of rain 60%. And then, uh, hmm, scattered thunderstorms for Thursday, May the 28th. Uh, that's scattered thunderstorms in the morning, and then mainly cloudy during the afternoon, with uh, thunderstorms likely. Highs around 81 degrees Fahrenheit, winds north to northeast at 5 to 10 miles per hour, chances of rain 80%, and then thunderstorms likely in the evening, then a chance of scattered thunderstorms later on in the day. Lows around 66 degrees Fahrenheit, winds north at 5 to 10 miles per hour, chances of rain 80%, and there you have your five-day forecast for the St. Charles Buing area. Um, hey, y'all want to watch a kind of goofy, kind of not, uh, not difficult, not bad, um, so, uh, so, uh, um, binge watch? It's called, um, Heart of Dixie. Yes, Heart of Dixie. And, well, it's pretty good, so you might want to watch it. Uh, it's, it's funny. It's a kind of a lovish story, kind of like thing. Kind of a city girl goes to the country and becomes the heart of Dixie. All righty then. Hey, um, today I'm going to read Uncle Tom's Cabin. It's for children, don't you know? And it's adapted by uh, Helen Rain Robinson by Harriet Betcher Stowe, Pen Publishing. To uh, Al Kalan, uh, Al, Al, Al Kayan, to Al Kayan. And here we go. Uncle Tom's Cabin. Well, maybe. What? Uncle Tom's Cabin means now. All these things happened many years ago. For more than 40 years, there have been no slaves in this country. There, they were all set free during a long war between the North and the South. It was a war high, which uh, destroyed slavery and kept our country whole. But it was about a war which brought death to many thousands of the country's best and bravest sons, both the North and the South. In, it was a war which brought poverty and sorrow worse than death to many uh, thousands of men and women. Our country was scared. Uh, scared like poor Tom under the lash of le leaguer. It was made desolate like a forest when a fire has swept over it. But as the years passed by, new trees sprang up in the forest and flowers grew again, all the more lovely because of the dis destroying flames uncle tom's cabin so it has been with the this dear land of ours in the long terrible struggle the north and the south leaned uh, learned to know and to respect each other as they had never done before they learned also how great their strength would be if they should stand together and so they have stood together for many years, the North and the South, the East and the West, our country awaiting the morn, or um, of noble day, 
enthroned between her subject seas. Why then, it, why then, it may be asked, should a new edition of Uncle Tom's Cabin be prepared especially for children? Why should young boys and girls read this story of cru uh, cruelties that are past, of scars that are healed, of sad days that may well be forgotten? There are... Mm, there are two answers to this question. One is the, the unique place which Uncle Tom's Cabin holds in the history of American literature. That has been briefly described in the sketch of Harriet Vetcher Stowe, which, with which this volume ends. And when young children's minds are first rousing to an interest in a, the history of their country, then it is the time for them to learn about the books which have helped to make their, that history. The other reason is in a deep one is a deeper one. The greater evils in our country were not swept away by the Emancipa Emancipation Proclamation. Just such evils as are described in Uncle Tom's cabins are to be sure no longer possible here. But there are even worse forms of slavery than those Miss Stowe talked, tells about in her book, and there are many cruel matters who uh, still hold the t la leash, the lash, cruel masters who still hold the lash. The boys and girls of today in the South, in the North, will, as men and women, have to do their past in destroying their these other forms of slavery. Uncle Tom's Cabin, every story these children read, which moves their sympathy for the poor and wretched, whether black or white, will help to fit them for the work that lies before them. Each book, every book, that teaches them to pity suffering and to hate cruelty will bring near, nearer the dawn of a new emancipation morning. Such a book, most surely, is Uncle Tom's Cabin. You know what? I think they changed this book around a lot. And if they have, then it's not worth reading because we're going somewhere else. We're not reading it. Sorry, folks, but we are not reading this particular, particular uh, volume of the book. That's not where I wanted to be. There. How about the Arabian Nights instead? We're going to do the Arabian Nights instead. The Arabian Nights, like Arabian Days. The Arabian Nights, their best known tales. Edited by Katie Douglas, Wiggins, and Nora A. Smith. Preface, no. Mm, preface, no. Table of contents, yes. Illustrations, no. The Arabian Nights. Mm, the Talking Bird, the Singing Tree, and the Golden Water. These are the stories which were told. There was an emperor of Persia named Karashath, who, when he first came to his crown, in order to obtain a knowledge of affairs, took great pleasure in night excursions 
attended by a trusty minister. He often walked in disguise through the city and met with his, with many adventure. Oh, here we go. There we go. Hmm. Trustworthy minister, he often walked in disguise through the city and met with many adventurers. One of the most remarkable of which happened to him upon his first ramble, which was not long after his ascension to the throne of his father. After the ceremonies of his father's funeral, funeral rites and his own inaugurations were over, the new sultan, as well from inclination as from duty, went out one evening attended by his grand vizier, disguised like himself, to observe what was transacting in the city. As he was passing through a street in the in that part of the town inhabited only by the meaner sort, he heard some people talking very loud, and growing going closer to the house whence the noise proceeded, he and looking through a crack in the door perceived a light and three sitters sitting on a sofa conversing together after supper by what the eldest said he pre presently understood the subject of their conversation was wishes for uh, she said since we are talking about wishes mine shall be to have the sultan's baker for my husband for then i shall eat my fill of that bread which by the way of excellence is called the sultan's let us see if your tastes come on now let us see if your tastes are as good as mine for my part replied the second sister so I wish I was the wife of the Sultan's chief cook for then I should eat of the most excellent dishes and I am pursued that the Sultan's bread is common in the palace and I should not want any of that. Therefore, you see, addressing herself to her eldest sister, that I have a better taste than you. The youngest sister, who was very beautiful and had more charm and wit than her, the two elder sisters spoke in her turn. For my part, sisters, she said, I shall not limit my desires to such trif trifles, but take a higher flight and since we are upon wishing i wish to be the emperor's queen consort i would make him father of a prince whose heir should be gold on one side of whose hair should be gold on one side of his head and silver on the other And when he cried, the tears from his eyes should be pearls. And when he smiled, his vermilion lips should look like a rosebud, fresh bloom. The three sisters, which wishes particularly that uh, that of the youngest seemed so singular to the sultan that he resolved to gratify them in their desires but without communicating his design to his grand advisor he changed him he charged him only to take notice of the house and bring the three sisters before him the following day the grand advisor in a, executing the emperor's orders would but just give the sisters time to dress themselves to appear before he, her, his majesty without telling them the reason. 
He brought them to the palace and presented them to the emperor, who said to them, brought them to the emperor, who said to them, sorry. Do you remember the wishes you expressed last night when you were all in so pleasant a mood? Speak the truth. I must know what they were. At these unexpected words of the emperor, the three sisters were much confused, and they cast down their eyes and blushed, and the color which rose to their cheeks of the youngest quite captivated the emperor's heart modesty and fear lest the mighty have offended by their conversation kept them silent and the emperor perceiving their confusion said to encourage them fear nothing i did not send for you to distress you and since i see that without my intending without intending it that this is the effect of the question i asked as i know the wishes of each i will relieve you from your fears you added he who wished to be my wife sh shall have your desire this day and you continued he addressing himself to the two elder sisters, shall also be married to my chief baker and cook. As soon as the sultan had dis declared his pleasures, the youngest sister, setting her elders, elders an example, threw herself at the emperor's feet to express her gratitude. Sir, she said, my wish, since it is come to your majesty's knowledge was expressed only in the way of conversation and amusement i am unworthy of the honor you do me you do me and supplicate your pardon for my presumption presumption the other two sisters would have excused themselves also but the inter, uh, emperor uh, interrupted them saying no no it shall be as i have declared the wishes of all you sh all shall be fulfilled the nuptials were all celebrated that day as the emperor had resolved but in a different manner the youngest sisters youngest sisters were solemn solemnized with all three rejoicing usual at the marriage of the emperors of persia and those of the other two sisters according to the quality of distinction of their hu husbands uh, the ones as the sultan's chief baker and the other as her head cook the two um, elder felt strongly the disproportion of their marriages the disproportion of their marriages sorry whenever I change page up it loses half of it the youngest sisters were to the sultan's chief cook and beggar the two elder sisters felt strongly the disproportion of their marriages to that of their younger sister and this consideration made them far from being content though they were and they were arrived at the utmost highest of their late late wishes and much beyond their hopes they gave themselves up to an ex excess of jealousy which not only disturbed their joy but was the cause of great trouble and affliction to the queen consort their younger sister
They had not an opportunity to communicate their thoughts to each other on the preference the emperor had given her, but were altogether employed in preparing themselves for the celebration of their marriages. Some days afterwards, when they had an opportunity of seeing each other at the public baths, the eldest said to the others, Well, what say you to our sister's great fortune? Is not she a fine person to be a queen? I must own, said the other sister, I cannot conceive what charm the emperor could discover to be so bewitched by her. Was it a reason sufficient for him not to cast his eyes on you because you, because she was somewhat younger? You were as worthy as he, of his throne, and in ju justice he ought to have preferred you. Sister, she said, said the elder, I should not have regretted it if the, his majesty had but pitched, pitched upon you, but that he should choose the that little simpleton really grieves me, but I will revenge myself, and you, I think, are as much concerned as I, and therefore I propose that we should contrive measures and act in con concert. Communicate to me what you think is the likeliest way to mortify her, while I, on my side, will inform you of what my desires of revenge shall suggest to me. And after this wicked agreement, the two sisters saw each other frequently, and consulted how they might and consulted on how they might disturb or disturb and interrupt the happiness of the queen. They proposed a great many ways, but in deliberating about the manner of ex executing them found so many dip difficulties that they burst not uh, they durst not attempt them. In the meantime, with a detestable dissimulation, they often went together to make her visits and every time showed her all the marks of affection they could desire uh, devise to persuade her how overjoyed they were to have a sister raised to so high of a fortune. The queen, on her part, constantly received them with all the determination of eastern demonstration of eastern all the demonstration of esteem they could expect from so near a relative. Sometimes after her marriage, the expected birth of an her gave great joy to the queen and emperor, which was communicated to all the court and spread throughout the empire. Upon the news, the two sisters came to pay their con compliments and preferred their services during uh, desiring her desiring her if not provided with nurses to accept of them the queen said to them most oblig obligingly sisters I should desire nothing more if it were in my power to make the choice I am, however, obligated to you for your good will, but most must submit to you what the emperor shall order on this occasion. Let your husbands employ their friends to make interests and get some 
courtier to ask this favor of his majesty and if he speaks to me about it I assure you that I shall not only express the pleasure he does me but thank him for making choices of you the two husbands applied themselves to some courtiers and their patrons and begged of them to use their interests to procure their wives the honor they aspired to hmm, those pa patrons exerted themselves so much in their behalf that the emperor promised them to consider of the to consider of the matter and was as good as his word for in conservation in conversations with the queen he told her that he thought her sisters were the most popular persons to be about her but would not name them before he had asked her consent and the queen sensible of the difference the emperor so obligingly paid her said to him sir i was prepared to do you to do as your majesty might pleasure me to command but since since you have been so kind as to think of my sisters i thank you for the regard that you have shown them for my sake and therefore i shall not disassemble that i had rather have them than strangers the empire therefore named the queen's two sisters to be the emperor therefore named the sisters to be her attendants and from that day they went frequently to the palace overjoyed at the opportunity they would have of executing the detestable wickedness they had meditated against the queen shortly after afterwards a young prince as bright as the day was born to the queen but neither his innocence nor beauty could move the cruel hearts of the miraculous, miraculous sisters they wrapped him up carelessly in his clothes and put him into a basket which they abandoned to the stream of a small canal that ran under the queen's apartment and declared that she had given birth to a puppy this dreadful intelligence was announced to the emperor who became so angry at the circumstance that he was likely to have occasioned the queen's death if his grand visor had not re represented to him that he could not withhold injustice make her an as answerable for this the misfortune in the meantime the basket in which the little prince was exposed was carried by the stream beyond the walls which bounded the prospects of the queen's apartment and from the thence floated with the currents down the gardens by chance the intendant of the emperor's gardeners on one of the principal officers of the kingdom was walking in the garden by the side of the canal and perceiving a basket floating called to a gardener who was not far off to bring it to shore that he might see what it contained the gardener the gardener with a rake which he had in his hand drew the basket to the side of the canal took it up and gave it to him and the in intendant of the gardens was extremely surprised to see in the basket a child which though he knew it could be but just born had very fine features 
This officer had been mar married several years, but though he had always been desirous of having children, have, heaven had never blessed him with any. This accident interu interpreted his walk, interrupted his walk, and he made the gardener's fellow follow him with the child. And when he came to his own house, which was situated at the entrance of the gardens of the palace, went into his wife's apartment. Wife, he said, as we have no children of our own, God has sent us one. I recommended him to you, provide him with a nurse, and take as much care of him as if he were our own son. And for, from this minute on, I acknowledge him as much, or as such. The, in, the attendant's wife received the child with great joy and took particular pleasure in the care of him. The intendant himself would not inquire too many narrow, too narrowly whether, whence the infant came. He saw plainly it came not far off from the queen's apartment, but it was not his business to examine too closely into what had passed, nor to create disturbances in a place where Peace was so necessary. The following year, another prince was born, on whom the unnatural sisters had no more compassion than on his brother, but exposed him likewise in a basket and set him adrift in the canal, pretending this time that the sultan's sultan had given birth to a cat. It was happy also for this child that Sultan had given birth to a cat. It was happy also for this child that the intendant of the garden was walking by the canal side, side for he had it carried to his wife and charged her to take as much care of it as of the former, which was as agreeable to her inclination as it was to his own the emperor of persia was more enraged this time against the queen than before and she had felt the effects of his anger if the guard adviser the grand vizier reminiscence had not prevailed the third year the queen gave birth to a princess which in, in which innocent babe underwent the same fate as her brothers, for the two sisters being determined not to detest more their detestable schemes till they had seen the queen cast off and hum humbled, claimed that a log of wood had been born and exposed expressed there. A log of wood had been born and exposed. This infant also on the canal, but the princess as well as her brothers was preserved from death by the compassion of and charity of the intendant of the gardens. Kurashish could no longer contain himself. When he was informed of the new misfortune, he pronounced a sentence of death upon the wretched queen and ordered the grand vizier to see it, ex see it executed. The grand vizier and the country courtiers who were present cast themselves at the emperor's feet to beg him to revoke the sentence. Your majesty, I hope, will give me leave, said the 
Grand Visor, to present you to you that the laws which condemn persons to death were made to punish crimes. The three ex extraordinary misfortunes of the queen are not crimes, for in what can she be said to have contributed towards them? Your majesty may abstain from seeing her, but let her live. The affliction in which she will spend the rest of her life after the loss of your favor will be punishment sufficiently dis uh, distressing. The Emperor of Persia considered with himself and reflecting that it was unjust to condemn the queen to death for what had happened for what had happened said let her live then I will spare her life but it shall be on this condition that she shall shall desire to dine more than once every day let a wooden shed be built for her at the gate of the principal mosque with iron bars to the windows and let her be put into it it in the corset habit and every mm, musulman m musulman that shall go into the mosque to prayer prayers shall heap scorn upon her and if any one fail I will have him exposed to the same punishment and uh, that I may be potentially obeyed. I charge you, Visor, to appoint persons to see this done. The Emperor pronounced his sentence in such a town in such a tone that the guard visor Grand Visor durst not further remonstrate. And it was executed. Executed. I keep turning the page. And it was executed in the, to the great satisfaction of the two envious sisters. A shed was built, and the queen, truly worthy of compassion, was put into it and exposed in generously to the contempt of the people which usage she bore with a patient resignation that ex excited the compassion of those who were discriminating and judging of the things better than the vul than the vulgar the two princes and the princess were in the meantime nursed and brought up by the intendant of the gardens and his wife with the tenderness of a father and a mother and as they advanced in age they all showed marks of superior dignity which discovered itself every day by a certain air which could only belong to exalted birth. All the, this increased the affection of the intendant and his wife, who called the eldest prince of Bahama and the second Pervez, and both of them names of the most ancient emperors of Persia, and the princess Presidenta, which name also had been borne by several queens and princesses in the kingdom. As soon as the two princes were old enough, the intendant provided proper masters to teach them to read and write, and the princess, their si princess, their sister, who was often with them showing a great desire to learn the intendant pleased with her quickness 
employed the same masters to teach her also. Her uh, vivacity and perceiving wit made her in a little time as great a proficient as her brothers. From time to time, the brothers and sister had the same minister, master in geography, poetry, history, and even the secret and senses, censors, and made so wonderful progress that their tutors were amazed and frankly owned that they could teach them nothing more. At the, uh, at the hours of recollection, recreation the prince uh, the princess learned to sing and play upon all sorts of instruments and when the princess princess princes were learning to ride she would not permit them to have that advantage over her but when they all the exercises with them learning to ride also to bend and bow and dart the reed or javelin and oftentimes outdid them in the race and other con contests of agility. The intendant of the garden was so overjoyed to find his adopted children so accomplished in all their perfections of the body and mind that they so well required the expense that he had been at their education that he resolved to be at a still greater for as he had untied until then became content simply with his lodge at the entrance of the garden and kept no country house. He purchased a mansion at a short distance from the city surrounded by a large tract of arable land, meadows, and woods. As the house was not sufficiently handsome nor convenient, he pulled it down and spared no expense by building a more magnificent residence. He went every day to hasten by his presence the great number. I wonder how many pages this is. Okay, well, I think... Insisted of sitting on a sofa would only well I'm lost your advisor to represent to the laws which condemned blah 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 okay well I'm going to leave it at this today and I think we're on page 32. And we'll find out tomorrow exactly where we are. And we will continue with the Arabian Nights, their best known tales. Okay? Alrighty then. Okay, that will do that. Looks like it's time for our portion of the program called Our Daily Bread, brought to you by The Bible with Briscoe 2020. That's right, a uh, daily reading of the Bible or to be completed within one year. A reading a portion of the Old Testament and a reading portion of the New Testament. Today's scriptures insight or today's today's um, devotion is called Keepers of the Light. And the inscriptions that go with that would be the scripture insight would be John eight, twelve through twenty uh, twelve through sixteen. John eight, twelve through sixteen. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, 
I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The Pharisees challenged him, Here you are appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. Jesus answered, Even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid, for I know where I came from and where I am going. But you have no idea where I came from or where I am going. You judge by human standards, and I pass judgment no, on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are true, because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. Ooh, there you go. That was John 8, 12, six, 12 through 16. And that concludes the Daily Bread portion of our program, brought to you by... The Bible with Briscoe 2020. Alrighty, that's got it for tonight. Um, that'll be the end of it. This here has been Shenandoah Briscoe saying hello and how are you? Thanks for tuning in to the Shen Show. And hey, tell me if you like the reading. Um, if that's a good idea, not, yes or no, uh, let me know. Uh, throw down some comments down below, okay? Alrighty then. Shenandoah Briscoe saying, well, goodbye, my friends. It's uh, time to go. But I said, goodbye, my friends. It's uh, time to go. I hate to leave you, but I really must go. So goodbye, my friends. Goodbye. This here has been Shenandoah Briscoe saying, hello, and how are you? Thanks for tuning in to the Shen Show. And as always, you know, God loves you, and so do I. So come back and see me tomorrow because, well, hey, I'll be here, and I hope that you are, too.